was uh, the story of Anita, a beekeeper in India. Maria will tell us more about that in, as we sort of speak more in this evening. But one of the things I know that I'm, I'm struck by, and I'm sure all of you are as well, that in India, where we have had a woman prime minister, where we have a woman president, and where we have a woman who's a speaker uh, of the Lok Sabha, guess what the sex ratio figures are? Guess how many girls aren't even allowed to be born? For every thousand boys that are born in this country, 933 girls are born, which means the others don't even forget what happens to girls when they actually are growing up. In India, we're actually grappling with the invisible issue of feticide. I say invisible because it never gets the attention it deserves. And to break the whole mythology that this is what happens to poor, uneducated, illiterate people, actually the sex ratio is lower in urban India, where for every 1,000 boys that are born, only 900 girls are born. This is the 2001 census of India. That said, I think as we heard from Anita's story, it's important to move beyond looking at girls as just victims. And I think that's something very important that we're going to focus on today. And two, it's very important to stop talking about girls as if it's that thing that happens in the corner when the men are out there busy doing important things. One of the things we were discussing before, while we were waiting for our male panelists uh, to arrive, was that uh, is this going to be one of those female-only panels where five women gather together and talk about girls. And I think all of us agree that that is among the most damaging thing we can do to leave men and boys out of the conversation, even though they joke often that men always remain boys. But to get started, I want to start with Maria Itel, who's closely associated uh, with that video about Anita. Maria, one of the things about talking about the issue of girl rights is that it tends to look at little girls as victims. It, it never looks at them as a resource. And I saw very clearly an attempt to, to, to change that perception in that video. Do you find, uh, as part of your work with the Nike Foundation, that that was one of the big cultural stereotypes that you had to actually counter, that listen, a girl is also a resource. A girl is also an asset. What we found, and we decided, what, what are we going to invest in with the Nike Foundation? And what became very clear to us, the single most impactful investment we could make was in adolescent girls. They are the mother of every child that will be born into the next generation. So if we're just purely looking at what is the most important engine for growth for India and for other economies is to unleash the enormous potential that a girl has to transform not just her family, but her community and her whole nation. And if you just take a couple of indicators and run the numbers, you get to very, very staggering numbers very quickly. If you look for India specifically, adolescent pregnancy, joblessness, and the lack of secondary school completion could, if, if we could solve those issues, we could add $56 billion to the Indian economy annually. Those numbers, numbers were, came from American University in Beirut and the World Bank. But we don't take a look at girls from that perspective. We're always looking at the victim equation as opposed to the opportunity equation. And so we found that the, the, this video and the idea of seeing girls as these powerful agents for change, but they can't be if they're pregnant, HIV positive, and married before they have a chance to enter the playing field of life. Hmm. Chanda Kocha, if I can get you in. Uh, speaking from an Indian perspective, pushing girls into an early marriage is something that I think girls everywhere in India, and I don't know, maybe there would be interesting comparison with other cultures, but I know in India almost every girl, perhaps younger when you're in rural India, but even in urban India, there is that whole pressure to get married. And almost as if marriage is then the centerpiece of life, and, and girls become diffident about pursuing anything beyond that. Uh, do you find that that's changing, or when you look around you, do you feel it's exactly the same? Well, I don't think it's exactly the same. Uh, I think it's changing, but again, I wouldn't say that uh, you know all has been done. So, uh, especially in urban India, I think girls are now not thinking of marriage as the centerpiece of their life, but are first thinking of finishing their education and creating an identity for themselves before they think of marriage. Uh, but I would not believe that all this has changed in rural India. Uh, but. I think the way, again, to approach this is, as you said earlier, that 
if we look at girls as a responsibility and a liability, then we will handle it in a different manner. But if we look at them as assets, we will then approach the whole thing in a different manner. And uh, what is important to really create the whole girl population into an asset, uh, in my view, is really to give three E's. If we uh, give education, uh, employment opportunity, and empowerment, then I think that is what will unleash uh, you know, the whole potential of the girl power for the economy. Mm. Vinita Bali, what is the most infuriating thing that you've ever heard when it comes to the issue of discussing girls? <laughs> I think just that, discussing and not taking enough action. Um, you know, I think the statistics and everything else is pretty well known. Um, you know, interestingly, ours is, um, you know, the rights of girls and women are built into our constitution. There are several ministries that deal with all of these issues. So I think the time has come for us to say we know what the issues are. We need to move on from, what, from the issue to therefore what concrete specific action will be taken by individuals, will be taken by corporates, will be taken by government, will be taken by the various ministries. Because I think we've done a lot of debate and discussion, and I actually think we've not seen enough action. Are there cliches that annoy you? You know, certainly there are the cliches, and you know, we all know, and I think it's been very well documented. The World Economic Forum has done the study. We know that if you invest in um, a girl or invest in women, uh, they are, you know, they enhance economic well-being and productivity. We've looked at all of these issues. We know what comes in the way of uh, little girls dropping out of school. If you look at our primary enrollment and if you look at secondary and tertiary education, a lot of women drop out not because they don't want to study, but because there are other social factors that inhibit. Um, you know, I do a lot of traveling and I do like to travel in rural India. Now, the encouraging thing is you see a lot more girls in school than certainly I remember seeing 10 or 15 years ago. The infuriating thing is that most of them drop out before they finish secondary education, not because they don't want to study, but because they don't have infrastructure. There aren't you know, for example, restrooms in schools. The parents are afraid to let the girls go alone to a school. Now, you know, I think there's got to be a more holistic and comprehensive view of this. Mm. Um, you know, everybody's looking at it from their own point of view. You know, the Ministry of Education is involved, rural development is involved, everybody's involved. But it's not at the centerpiece of anybody's agenda. It is a periphery to a lot of agendas. It's a silo in a sense, it's separated, it's not mainstreamed uh, enough. Lord Hastings, if I can get you in, one of the things that's often argued is that till there is equal parenting, mm -hmm. in a sense, growing up as a girl uh, is a very different experience from growing up as a boy because your first role model, in a sense, is your mother. And I know that this debate goes on in, in, in our newsroom a lot of times, that those of us who grew up with working mothers and those who grew up with women who prefer to stay at home often grow up with a very sense of what, a different sense of what they need to bring to the workplace. So <laughs> if you reverse that, how do you deal with qu the question of women who are also running homes and also working? Because in a sense, their girls and boys are looking to that for cues. Well, you're asking a very strategic question. You're <laughs> talking about the structure of how a modern industry works. Yes. Where men and women are both effective in the workplace. That ought to be the ideal. So how do you change the model? How do you change the aspiration? The aspiration for girls is not simply to, as it were, repeat the traditional model following on from mother to have children, to get married early, to simply fall in line with men's interests or desires. It is to place themselves in a dignified and independent position, able to think clearly and academically, able to understand their world, able to chart a path for the future. That has to come, and this is going to be the difficult bit that relates to the two men who are on the panel and the multitude of men who are in the audience, it has to come from a change in men's exactly. behavior. And at the root of the issue lies, despite all the layers of legislation and the mountains of government resources that are poured in from OECD countries to developing economies, is that still the unconscious biases of men frequently prevent women and girls from making that progression leap. And I think also, that there is the absence of an international, let in a national public story for girls' progression, which needs to be created. We become familiar in the whole of the world, developing, developed uh, and emerging economies with the necessity of the public story around health issues, HIV, AIDS or malaria issues, for example. 
we become very familiar with the public story around development questions and debt relief. Well, what is the necessary public story that needs to be articulated here around girls' progression? It's a very evident one. It is about the stabilization of the next round of big economies in the world. It's about the huge talent that needs to be unleashed and realized. It's about the employment potential of 600 million citizens of the world who can be healthy role models and providers. And it isn't just about saying men get out of the way. It is about saying men mature and change your values, <coughs> behaviors, perceptions, and attitudes. Become equivalent supporters likewise and be prepared to see your girls thrive. That's an investment in education from the roots and employment for the future. But that is so much part of uh, current discourse today that uh, why doesn't it happen more easily directly? Well, because I think that by the time the men you're talking to, you try to talk to them, are already set in their ways. You know, A lot of what their beliefs are are part of their religion, part of the way they've been raised. So I don't think that's going to be a very effective approach with all due respect. I think that what you have to do is to look at a couple things. One is that of the domestic workers in the world, 90% are girls from the age of 12 to 17. And if you look at the fact that by the age of 18, girls have on average 4.4 years less of schooling, that people talk about government resources. I don't think that it's enough. I think that if the government were to say, number one, you girls need to complete to a certain level of school, and there is an economic reward for the family for doing so, that's very practical and it will change. In the example here, Anita went on a hunger strike. Well, most girls aren't going to be able, or most boys for that matter, are gonna go on a hunger strike. So the government needs to be there in saying, listen, here's the, not only an educational program, but if you go to school, there's a financial reward for your family. That's really where the rubber will meet the road, road because it has to change with the young generation. The old generation, too hard, I think. So that's where I would differ. I think Well, I think we need to have money. a debate about whether you abandon the attitudes of the old, simply uh -huh. say, this is a generation that holds decision-making and power, so we'll leave them to one side. We'll only work on, on the young. I'm not convinced that that is going to be the safest route forward, because we're talking about a talent gap that is 2009, not one that is prospectively 10 to 15 years away. Though there's an interesting question thrown up uh, in terms of dealing with social and cultural prejudices, which are often so deep-seated that people don't see them as prejudice, and that becomes yes. part of the problem. Rajshree, if I can uh, get you into that, it, it is like most girls growing up in India. If, for example, when we talk about feticide, uh, how do you judge a poor family in somewhere in rural India who says, okay, a girl, if I have a daughter, I'm going to have to pay dowry, I'm going to have to, uh, you know, get her married. That is the mindset. We, we may say, oh, that's obnoxious, but the point is that is entrenched, and that is that father or mother's reality. So in a sense, at some point, are we going to have to deal with that cultural and social prejudices, as Daryl is, is arguing? But our progress, economic progress in a certain area or a certain region is very important. I have seen myself, when I first started the sugar factory, it was in the most backward district of uh, South India really down below near Madurai. And uh, farmers were really poor. They had no sustenance except their dry lands. When the industry happened, I see that 15 years later, the farmers' children, the farmers come to me with their girls who have finished high school and they say, you know, the, I, I, I want to educate my daughter. I want her to go to college. Tell me where and how should I apply? Where would I get in? Uh, you know, so I find this remarkable change. And what brings about this change? Economic progress. And um, I think it's important. But um, that doesn't explain what happens in urban India still. There is a societal attitude. Sometimes economics gives us the answer. And sometimes it doesn't. Chanda? But even for uh, a change in the societal attitude, I think it's important to invest in girls. Because today's girls are going to be mothers of tomorrow. So if we have to change our approach of how we want to bring up girls, you know, you said earlier that when many of us uh, did not really come from families where our mothers were working, but we came from a family where the family believed that it's important to educate all the children, whether it's a girl child or a male child. And I think that made all the difference. So if we have to make sure that that kind of approach is taken, and first the girl is educated, even before the girl can look for employment opportunities, then the whole approach towards the girl-child has to change in the family. 
and there cannot be a bigger change agent than the mother. So if we invest in today's girls, I think we can at least bring about that change in the future. We should remember that in the developing economies, a quarter of the population of the developing economies is the young girls in the age from 10 to 24. These are the people who are going to make the mothers of tomorrow. So if we invest in this quarter of the population, I think the multiplier effect of them impacting the societal approach towards girl is going to be manifold later. But Maria, as somebody who travels around the world and deals then with girls in different countries, I come back to the point of, of culture and variations across countries as to what the issues are. For example, in America, teen pregnancies and what happens to girls you know, who don't have access to health care may be a huge issue. In India, we have issues like not permitting a parent to actually know the gender of their unborn child for fear that they may kill the daughter off. So there's a huge sort of gap. So where do we create a kind of model that we can all agree on? What's very interesting is this is really an economic story. It's easy to look at it from a cultural perspective. If we think about a girl, she comes into the world with one asset, which is her body. Its maximum value is when she's a virgin and before she's married. That will be transacted, transacted when it's at the, her maximum value. So of course the family makes a rational short-term economic decision which shoots them in the foot for a long-term economic decision which would be for the growth of their family, community, and country. So what we find, I'll use an example in Ethiopia which could just as well be in India. I was just there last week. And we were, we were working on a program that's around early marriage. This is one of the greatest areas of child marriage in Ethiopia. We had a program where we brought safe spaces to girls, allowed them, whether they were married or unmarried girls, the opportunity to get skills and opportunities for safety, et cetera. What happened is then we had men's clubs. And the men's were the fathers who came together. If we had just tried to help the girls, what they said, we can't succeed if you don't if you don't convince our parents um, that this isn't going to be the right decision for us. So to a meeting of the men's, the men's club, which was an amazing meeting, and there were men arguing after a year, meeting twice uh, every other month, they were arguing whether you should charge a, a family 50 burr or 100 burr, which is the Ethiopian currency, if they don't send their daughter to school. And then another man stood up and he said, we should send them to prison. And then another man stood up and said, we don't have a prison. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, what was amazing, though, is these were the same men that previously were having their daughters marry as early as 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, where it was seen as a cultural tradition. So I asked those men, what had changed? And what they said is they didn't understand what was the reality of their daughter. They didn't understand what it was like to walk at 10 and 12 years old into a marriage. What was that very real experience? And then also they brought in religious leaders who said, actually, this is not part of our religion. Child marriage is not part of our religion. Female genital, none of these things are part of our religion. These are distortions. And then you saw a real change. And as they saw, that they learned that the economic value to their family was to have an educated daughter who would then go on and, and educate. And then they were saying, and I want education too. And that's where we see what we call this girl effect, which is you don't just help her. All of a sudden, this incredible multiplier occurs, but it's critical to get right at those cultural issues and see that they aren't necessarily always cultural. Poverty is a very, is, is a, a, a rational economic mm. decision when you make that. Vinita, would you agree that at the, at the heart of it, the solution and the approach is to create a kind of economic incentive? That at the end of it, that is a language that at least speaks to the poor? Oh, absolutely. I think there is the economic incentive is a very, very powerful tool. And you know, in many ways, uh, I think we're seeing a subtle but very, very definitive change that is occurring here. And that's interesting. Um, you know, a lot of women who, for example, are working uh, as household help or women who are working in the fields are really, really determined not to let their daughters live the lives that they've they lived. lived yeah. So, for example, they're working really hard to send their daughters to English schools. And if you talk to people around you, if you talk to the women who work in your house, you will begin to see that there is a big change that is occurring. We're not seeing the full ramification of it yet, but I think in the next five to 10 years, it'll have a significant impact. And those women are determined to do what it takes to not allow their daughters to go through what they've gone through. And that's hugely significant because they've seen 
the economic impact of that, they've seen the social impact of that, they've seen the impact that that has on the health of the girl. Um, so, you know, there is that change that is beneath the surface. I just think that we can do a lot more by way of economics, et cetera, to provide a catalyst to that change. Mm. Because you know, if you say everybody signed up for the Millennium Goals, and you know, by 2015 or whatever that date was, I think 2015, you know, there was supposed to be equality, et cetera, et cetera. We're far behind from that. You know, at this rate, it's going to be 2050 till India reaches its Millennium Goals. So I think we've got what needs to be done. I think the incentives, whether it is economic, social, or cultural incentives, if they can be used to catalyze, because I think there are enough women there determined to make that difference for themselves. Darren, since you brought up the point of, of social uh, attitudes, societal attitudes, in a sense, is economics enough? Is education enough? Because those are the two conventional solutions that are always offered up. But, but, but does it end there, or is it more deep-seated than that? I think it has to be a two-pronged approach, and I think that if you can do the educational part, that's fine. But I don't think the economic approach really is there. Everyone talks about it. The question I would have is for a rural family in India, if you were to say every month that your daughter has a 95% attendance at school, then there's so much money we'll pay you. And at the end of the year, if they advance, there's so much money to pay you. How much money would that cost overall vis-a-vis -vis the 1,000 crore that has just been put in the budget for the vocational. Yeah. Everyone talks about it, and the, the stories are nice, but the fact is most people, if there's not an economic incentive and a real one, are going to have trouble breaking out of this no matter how much you educate. It has to be both, I believe. Mm. Well, yes, if I can get you in, we seem to be focusing on girls who are poor, deprived of a certain socioeconomic strata. But there are also girls who grew up in cities who have a certain degree of, I wouldn't call it affluence, but a certain degree of economic well-being. But they're still growing up differently from their brothers. And they're, they're growing up with all kinds of mindsets of who they can be when they become women and who they can't be. And, 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 and how does one tackle that? We talk so much about the mother, but what about the father? Well, um, I have a very interesting example, which I only fell across this afternoon. I was just spending a bit of time flicking through one or two magazines, and I came across Fortune magazine, which has an interesting picture of Mr. Obama on the front, but ignore that. Inside are 40 people under 40 who are really making it in the world. Now, of course, when it comes to the education of young girls and into women, more women are graduating with higher quality degrees than are men, according to OECD, OECD figures. But if I went through the top 40 under 40, there is only one woman in the top 20, and there are only five women who come into the 40. That's not a realistic picture. In other words, there is a kind of, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was a, a, a media mindset that is determined for one central location, but there is a perception that women don't bring innovative technologies yeah. to bear. They don't bring uh, desirous new opportunities into the marketplace. Women are not at the core of business leadership. Women are not driving public policy initiatives. And that, that survey, interestingly, reflects that fact. How can you have five women out of 40 under 40, who are really the groundbreakers, mm. the stars of the future. It just doesn't follow logic. So I do think there is a role here for a, a place of a media conglomerate to come together alongside campaigners and, and businesses to work together to bring this issue to massive public attention and to drive both societal, educational, and behavioral change. I think that's a really interesting point. And Raj Shree, if I can get you into that, is the pro part of the problem, and therefore part of the solution, the way the media actually looks at the story. Uh, it's a story that, uh, that you know, is a s considered a soft story when it comes to talking about, about girls. It's not considered a hard story. The journalist, I can tell you that. Also speaking you know, for the women on the panel, I know that there is, when you talk about women who are doing well in their professions, almost every country can throw up a set of the same cliched names. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, and that's no disrespect to any of the, of the women achievers, but there is a kind of yeah. dire clichédness to the women who are called to talk about women and girls? Well, you know, it's funny uh, that you say this. Um, in, in our generation in India, uh, uh, there was a very uh, nice article that I think Business Today or one of the magazines had, um, had sort of profiled the women in business in India, and it said um, that the CEOs, the women CEOs that you find in India are here because, by default, because the families didn't produce sons. 
And this is very true. I looked at each and every one of the surah, and I was one of them. Um, you know, um, and, and is that true? I think it was true of that generation, of my generation, yes. Um, and it's different in banking, it's different in um, you know, other service um, um, sectors where uh, you know, largely professionalism uh, is, is, the, is the prime um, um, motivator. But certainly in family-run businesses, this is true. And it continues to, to remain so, uh, Barka. And, and I'm not, I don't see that palpable change um, happening even in the next generation. You know, whether it's girls are now in their 30s. But speaking personally, how did that make you feel growing up? That was there a <laughs> sense that I'm in, coming into this business because of my gender? And if there was a, a man around, it would be different? My life would be different? Well, you know, I grew up um, in a house where the parents were young. We were two daughters. So there was never, I didn't feel discrimination till I really stepped out into the real world. Uh, when my parents both died very young and I really stepped into the world and I started, I did feel the discrimination, yes, especially in a completely male-dominated uh, business like Sugar. And uh, people would think I was highly decorative on the board because, you know, I mean, um, I did look pretty those days and I was young and, uh, <laughs> and every time I'd reach out for the mic uh, on the committee to make a point, um, they would sort of, somebody else would sort of uh, take the microphone away and, you know, so and so who was, a, you know, an elderly gentleman in the industry for many years would get the chance to, an opportunity to speak. And, um, you know, it kind of destroys your self-confidence till you really sort of churn out that balance sheet that, that works. <laughs> and then, you know, the, the, the business community says, oh, well, you know, um, um, she's not only pretty, but she also runs a business. And somebody just said to me the other day, your company must be running by default. Um, and I said, <laughs> well, I said, well, congratulations to me then, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, I mean, it exists, it still exists. And I think it's, uh, um, but I think it's changing. I think education is changing. And um, more and more, um, you know, women are fighting within uh, business families. Um, because they're getting educated um, as, as well or better than their uh, male um, sons. And uh, they're fighting to get positions in, in businesses. And they're doing very well. I mean, they, 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 um, uh, they are, you know, kind of getting more visible and more vocal. Mm -hmm. And I'm all, you know, and I, it's, it's panels like this where I want to see policy makers. Yeah. Why is it I address so many, uh, you know, um, groups and women's forums and everywhere. And I never see ministers. You well, know, the, the most the most you'll get is the women for uh, the minister for women and child development. Yeah, you'll right. never get the health minister yeah. on. You'll never get the law minister law on. Minister, you'll never get the education minister, minister on. Minister for industry and commerce. Yeah. Why isn't it? Th why is it that forums like this are not getting the priority in conferences? Why are we not? Why are we still sort of sidelined and said, okay, this is perhaps the desert. You know, we <laughs> get lots of nice women talking about women's issues. It's it can't it's, be, it's, it's it can't be, it's a priority sector. Uh, but Chanda, Vinita, Maria, if I can get you in, Chanda to you first. This is part of the problem. What's the solution to that? You see, what happens is that part of the solution is to prop up. <laughs> I know, for example, uh, Anand Mahindra has started a foundation for girls called Nani Kali, where part of the solution is to say, okay, these are 100 women and, you know, little girls, you can be these women too. Is that part of the solution, that to say, look at all these amazing women? No, and they're not women who are separate from society. They're fully assimilated. They're leaders in professions that are gender neutral. And I think that's important, because to offer up leaders in gender-specific professions sometimes becomes as much of a cliche. See, Barkha, uh, you're right in saying that there are only some hand-picked names that you can yeah. pick up you know, when you talk of success stories. But let's analyze the root cause of you know, what the issue is. And I think that issue moves from through the evolution of the life of the woman, if we look at it today. When you start with education, we know that it's not just primary education. By the time it comes to graduation level, you know, the whole participation of women falls down the cliff. Then from graduation, if you move to skilled professional courses, the participation falls even further. From there, when you have a set of women joining uh, the, uh, you know, the workforce, Again, women go through some self-selection of jobs themselves. They say, I cannot do sales, I cannot do collections, I cannot do, so they, yeah. they just pick themselves. Mm -hmm. Then comes the period of childbirth, where some of them fall off. So finally, you know, the, the population that participates 
in becoming a managerial workforce itself has dwindled so much that you land up with very few success stories. So what we need to do is to work at each level. It's not just enough to feel happy that 85% of women are, or girls are registering for primary education. So therefore, we have to see how at graduate level we can increase participation. Then we have to see how can we create employment opportunities for women. Then we have to see that around childbirth, are there ways in which we can make infrastructural facilities available that prevents less and less people, less and less women from dropping off? Mm. And of course, along with that, we have to work on our mindset change, as I said, and on our societal change. So I don't think it's one economic incentive yeah. there, or you know, a few organizations talking of gender neutrality. I think this has to work throughout the system. And I would only say that some part of changes are taking place. Uh, some part of these changes will have an impact gradually as we go on because if, you know, the Anitas of the world today will not have to have their daughters going on hunger strikes. Yeah. They will make sure that their uh, girls are educated. Thing. Yeah. So it is something that needs to work through the system and it is something, therefore, that will only show impact in a gradual manner. But what we need to do today is to find each and every avenue where we need to work and make sure that we work at all these levels so that whatever little change is happening, we can accelerate it, we can catalyze it, and take this whole movement forward. Vinita, any, any sort of uh, lessons you draw from your own experience of growing up as a girl in India? Um, you know, I think the biggest thing is, uh, uh, you know, the, the feeling of confidence that, uh, you know, your parents, your school, everybody instills in you as you're growing up. And I think that's what gets you to believing in yourself. That's what gets you the conviction to say that I can do anything that is possible. So I think that belief, that conviction, is really, really critical and important. I just build on one of the points that uh, Chanda mentioned. It is, uh, it is a very, uh, you know, th this is multidimensional and multifaceted and has to be attacked that way. So if I were to think of it specifically, I think there are three roles that all of us can play. You know, one is what I as an individual can do to impact those around me. The second thing was I as an individual can do in the, in the corporate world or in the social world or whatever world I'm a part of to do, you know, bring about a more uh, meaningful change. Mm -hmm. And the third is how do we, people, people like us, can influence the policy that you were just talking about yeah. in order to make those big changes because I think any time there has been a significant change that has occurred anywhere. There are enough people with enough of a voice, either representing themselves or representing somebody else, to make that change. So I think the action lies at the level of the individual, at the level of the corporate, I'm using sort of loosely, and those individuals who happen to be in places where they can influence policy big time because, you know, that is the need of the art. Maria. Before I open it up to the audience, what's the one thing you found works as a solution? We've spoken about education, we've spoken about economic incentives, uh, more egalitarian workplace environments. Beyond that, what's the one thing that is a possible solution? Well, I think about C.K. Prahalad yesterday who talked to us about next practices. And if I observe that what we see happening on the ground here in India and other countries is things that will drive innovation. There's an enormous innovation opportunity here. There's a complete population that today is the infrastructure of poverty. An adolescent girl, as she carries water, is the plumbing system. <coughs> as she carries firewood, she's the electric grid. As she takes care of the sick, she's the healthcare system. When the cow dies or when someone gets sick in the family, she's the insurance policy. So as long, and she's the transportation system as well, as long as she continues to provide infrastructure for poverty, it will continue to exist. What we have to do is break that cycle by thinking it's not just education is the answer. She cannot be in school if she's spending her full day involved in chores. It's no mystery why she drops out of school in secondary, at the secondary level. Her, her free labor is needed in agriculture. It's needed to perform the tasks that the infrastructure is not providing. So it's key that we look at this not as someone's problem, not as one minister's or one company's issue, Every single uh, aspect needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, people say, well, you're not focusing on water or all these other issues. If you address the girl, all those other issues fall into place because she's 
the, the economy, that economy is dependent on her at the micro level. So I think the one thing that really works is to, to take into account the whole problem and to see it not just as a failure specifically there, but a failure of the system to provide an environment where she can, in fact, succeed. Well, before I ask the panelists for closing <coughs> comments, I'd like to open it to, to the floor now for questions or comments. Yes, the gentleman in front. Uh, if someone can just reach a mic to him, please. I don't think it's on. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm I'm glad that you've included two gentlemen in the panel because more actually. We we wanted more. I agree. <laughs> there should have been an equal number like it was in your yeah. session. <clears throat> I strongly believe that, you know, talking about solutions, women's empowerment can be sustained only if men feel empowered in the process of women's empowerment. If the men feel joyous, they feel good about it, then it can be sustained. That's my comment. My question is, uh, next week we are going to have the parliament session, winter parliament session, where there's going to be a big debate, you know, Barkha, of the women's reservation bill. Now, I was just thinking that it, doesn't it imply an acceptance by the women saying, who are pushing for this bill, we are inferior to men, that's why we need a reservation. Res it's, it's against meritocracy, isn't it? Okay, let me put that uh, to the panel. Darren, would you like to take that? Yes. Yeah, um, when I went to business school, I sat on the student my second year selection committee. And it's not a well-known fact, but there was a very clear profile on who got in. So if you're a woman, your GMAT score could be 100 points lo lower and you would pass the bar for examination. Or if you were a minority, same thing. If you're a white man, it was the hardest test to get in. The bars were different. So, is that fair or is that not? Does it imply inferiority or does it? I'm absolutely convinced that until you set up examples of success, no one will think they can do it. Yeah. And they've been behind for so long in so many ways, that's a small price to pay, to get people to experience that and then those bars will come back. There has to be an adjustment to account for historical inequalities. Yeah. And you know, if you're a white guy in America trying to get into business school, too bad. <laughs> you had a lot of advantages for a long time. You can't make it in too bad. That's my opinion, honestly, from my heart. You wanted to add to that? Well, that's, that's exactly why I would argue very stridently for a persuasive media campaign on this issue. Uh, it is a business issue. It's not a, just a values or a soft or a people issue or a gender issue. It is a business issue about talent and about economies of the future. It is about health and education and about development. It's about the nature and structure of secure economies that we want to see everywhere around the world. Therefore, it is a business driver issue. And I'd like to see the business magazines and newspapers and television broadcasters of this world make it as equally important as they've made other development issues. You know, I just wanted to make one other point that reservation doesn't mean that competency or meritocracy is not a consideration. Uh, it simply says, I think, as you've just said, that you know, if you're correcting for historical aberrations, then in addition to reservation, take people who are competent and do it based on meritocracy, because I think there are enough people out there who would make the cut on those factors alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, reservation is also deeply, in India, is a deeply politicized issue that has to do with caste uh, backgrounds and all of that as well, a whole different debate. But We'll move on. There's a gentleman at the back, the third row. Yes, sir. You can just stand up. We'll yeah. reach your mic. Okay. Um, I'm Brad Adams. Um, uh, there's a lot of very interesting ideas. Uh, and with your infrastructure idea, um, I work a lot on domestic violence. And why do men hit women? Because they can. I think that's fundamentally why they do it. They won't hit me. They won't hit a police officer, but they'll hit their wife because they can. They can get away with it. 
the place where they can vent their anger. So um, I'm, why are girls the infrastructure? Because they can be made the infrastructure. Why aren't boys the infrastructure? Um, because there's some, something, some other value placed on boys. And so I guess my question is, there's utilitarian arguments being made here, which I understand, and any incentives that can work should be tried, but there still is something else going on here that's very fundamental, and I think if we don't address that, we only can get part of the way. Um, Maria, do you want to take that? And I mean, it's, it's an interesting point about going back to societal attitudes. Yeah. Mm. How do you deal with those? What's ironic is the laws are in place. In most countries, it is illegal to marry before the age of 18. It is it, the property rights, for instance, inheritance rights, uh, sexual violence, all of these laws are often in place. The problem is they're not enforced. If you're raped and you go to the police, you'll be raped again. So unless we enforce these laws, we're not going to see progress. So I think it's essential that we have to actually follow through on the policies and the, and the commitments that we make with real action. The second thing is there are not real resources that go into this issue. When we decided to focus on adolescent girls, the, the NGOs that came to us for funding were asking for $3,000, $5,000. I said, what? For, for the issue that you're facing? But they were so used to not getting any resources for this issue that they were just hoping they would get something. They should be asking for $30 million, $300 million uh, for the level of return on that best investment. The, the, the uh, Prime Minister said uh, yesterday, 6% uh, uh, in education. Well, you could get that return very quickly on, on that investment if you put it into uh, the kinds of things we're talking about. If there was full enforcement, the kinds of budgets that we need to really see real change occur would start to, we get on a positive spiral. Right now, we're stuck. We need to break this cycle of laws that are in place that aren't enforced and not uh, um, insufficient resources to really deal with the, the level of the issues. All right, the gentleman at the back, right at the back. A fantastic panel. Thank you all very much. Uh, I guess this is for Maria too. As you look around the world, are there some nations or societies that you think have cracked this or at least have cracked it more than others? Widespread perception that China started girls' education 30, 40 years ago before a lot of other uh, low-income countries. But as you, as you travel around, do you, see, do you see somewhere where you think they've solved the problem? or Not, not that they've solved the problem, but that they have identified the potential of the girl effect and really done something about it? Well, I wish I had a, a plethora of wonderful examples. There's obviously a long way to go. But what seems to distinguish the countries, and not just countries, I will go away from countries to states or regions or villages or, or cities where some leader has made it a priority and hasn't just said it, but then has incentivized that behavior. Uh, for instance, here in, in, there, is, there is work around ensuring inheritance rights for girls. Well, when that happens, it shifts that value equation that we were talking about before, where all of a sudden she says, oh, I'm inheriting the land, just like my brother. I'm valuable. So when we see it happen at the village level or at the uh, whatever level it might be, it's essential that there are role models and there are examples. And where that happens, you see this multiplier effect where then it starts to become a cultural norm. I'm shocked that in Ethiopia, like I said, this specific example to stay on it, we, we saw within such a year a cultural norm overturned because there was now an economic incentive for that to occur. Firstly, great panel. <clears throat> but as I sat through the discussion, I got increasingly frustrated. And the reason why is because I think we are all in violent agreement with the issue and with the tremendous amount of work which needs to be done around the issue. My question is, how do we make these discussions a lot more action-oriented? Mm -hmm. And we get something out of these. Because at the end of this discussion, to a group of 200 people who probably feel similarly about this, and that's why they're here, there are going to be one and a half articles in the paper tomorrow morning, and perhaps some inspirational stories that we're going to take away. The question I have is, how do we get the right people around this table, and how do we make this really work? I think it's a great question, and let me give it to Vinita um, first. 
There's a, there's a sense of preaching to the converted. And, and it happens with a lot of gender-related issues. You end up talking amongst yourselves. And you're really, there might be minor disagreements, but you're not really engaging with people who think otherwise, who feel otherwise. How do we crack that? I think I sort of uh, said that. I experienced the same frustration, but I do believe, you know, there are 200 very, very influential people sitting in this room. We are all empowered to make decisions that we can make without actually, in many, many cases, not consulting anybody else because you know, those are the things that we influence either in our companies or in our, uh, you know, ministries or whatever. So I think, you know, again, I don't want to sound, but, you know, whatever change has to begin has to begin with each of us undertaking to do something at an individual level, something at, a, you know, at a more organized level, and also playing our role in impacting those changes. Because if the 200 people sitting here feel that they can't bring about a change, then I think there is very little hope for change. Uh, Chanda, building up on that, is there one thing that you were determined to change in your workplace? When you, when you look back at your own life and you say, listen, when I was growing up, I didn't have that. And when I'm in a position to change that, I'll make sure I do X differently. What would that be? Well, uh, one thing that uh, you know, we noticed in our workplace was that at the, in, you know, uh, at the original recruitment level, we were actually recruiting a lot more women. But when it came to finally reaching the managerial levels, many were falling off. So we said something which is really within our control of what we can decide and do is to at least create a facilitative environment where lesser women drop off around childbirth. So we changed a whole lot of practices around childbirth. You know, I think there are a few organizations that even give women leave up to six months if, if it's a case of maternity. We give them. Would you give men leave? Uh, well, if they ask for, we would. We would. Uh, and uh, you know, <laughs> what we do is is really. In hmm. fact, there are lots lots of uh, cases where the men have come and said that they want to just take off for a month or so because they need to take care of their children. Yeah. And and really, we give them that. There are many men who want transfers because their wives have been transferred, and we do that. Uh, you know, precious take care of uh, children of both male employees yes. and women employees. So adoption leaves, fertility leaves, uh, you know, maternity leaves. All this is one thing that you know we've, we've really recently brought about the change. The second is we've gone away from this mindset of saying that you know there is there is a self selection of job types that can be done for women. We believe that whatever is the frontline job. Uh, you know, let's offer it to women as well. So in our collections um, uh, department, in our sales department, also there are as many women, uh, you know, that are working. So these are some of the changes which we brought about for which we didn't have to really rely on the world. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, I'm happy to say that while, you know, in our entire workforce, 26% of uh, the workforce is women, but even at the top level where, uh, you know, if I have eight of people running my most important businesses or group companies, Two out of those eight are women. All right. Uh, yes, Lord Dave. I think that is such an important question that was asked there because we, of course, we're in violent agreement, which is sort of why we're on this panel. And then what do you do to persuade the people who are not in the audience here or maybe the half of the audience here who don't agree with us yeah. as a panel? And I, I first of all think that it's hugely to the, to the commendation of the World Economic Forum that at a summit on economic issues in a major... Uh, next developing economy like India, hugely powerful and significant, part of the G20 framework, this is what we're discussing on Monday. I think that is hugely valuable. And there was an earlier panel this afternoon also looking at, at women's issues within the business world. Very valuable. So I would look to the WEF, between us as businesses, to be able to work together on a strategic program over a two-year timeline that comes forward with specific recommendations and programs. I, for one, consign KPMG International up to that now because I know that our international board said that we're prioritizing Millennium Development Goals 1, 2, and 3. And MDG 3 is about women's empowerment. And you actually get to women's empowerment by making sure that you educate girls and ensure that girls have aspirations and good role models and positions in society, positions in business, and that you make sure all the things that Maria has discussed are dealt with holistically. So I would ask the World Economic Forum on behalf of all of us to say convene a business leaders group with academics and media organizations and force us into an objective setting process for the next two years. We've done that 
And the WEF did that extremely well over the issue of disaster relief, helping companies to coordinate activities around international disasters. Then let's do it around girls' empowerment. Rajshri, you wanted to add a quick point? Yes, I I, I, uh, you asked the question how we could all make a difference. I think every one of us and every one of our, our companies can make a difference in changing social uh, beliefs, in, um, in destroying um, any thought process in society that uh, sort of um, um, you know, uh, disrespects women. And uh, just a funny, um, but um, true example, in, in, uh, there's a joke going around uh, that any woman, married woman that comes to Rajshri Sugars gets divorced um, after a year or so. And, and, and there is, uh, the fact is that so many women coming to work, um, you know, uh, face domestic violence at home, even at uh, very senior levels. And, um, uh, you know, we have a process of counseling that gives the woman um, uh, confidence to actually get away from domestic violence. And uh, we, we set up separate accounts for them because most of the women, working women have joint accounts. They have no control over the money they earn, where it goes. It usually gets um, you know, controlled by the, uh, taken by the joint family. Most of them don't have um, work, uh, you know, help at home. They come to work at you know, uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, they go back home at 8 o'clock and they still have to cook. And they have to feed the mother-in-law, the father-in-law, take care. And, and these are women who are earning um, not less than you know, uh, 20, 30,000 rupees salaries. I'm talking even at that level. Mm -hmm. So um, I think each and every one of us can make a difference. And as women leaders, as women who, can, who have the power and the authority to actually um, provide jobs, um, uh, we should um, give more employment to women um, because one employed woman, um, uh, you know, uh, allowed so many other women in the family to actually be educated to get jobs. Uh, questions, anyone? Indra? Yes. Mm -hmm. make a comment about something. Yeah. I think there's a bit of an elephant in the room. Um, I don't think women's issues can be addressed by just women. Mm -hmm. I think there's the other half of yeah. the population, the men. How are we going to educate them? Yeah. How are we going to make sure that they too feel responsible for the advancement of women? How do we educate them to make sure they don't commit the domestic violence you just talked about, Rajshri? Because this entire discussion is about what women can do for women. When you talk about what can be done in society, Sanjeev, let's talk about what we're going to do to educate men. Yeah. Not make them feel happy, how to educate them. Mm -hmm. okay. Before I take that to the panel, Indra, I'm sure we'd all love to hear how, you, how you've dealt with it. How do, how, do you, how do you create a dialogue with men, let's say, at your workplace? I mean, how do we make this something that goes beyond being a women's issue? Yeah, let's talk about that because, uh, and pardon me showing my back to most of you there. You know, in PepsiCo, we have a diversity program. So we do create an environment where we make sure that we even manage by numbers. We say we have to have X percent of jobs where we do have women come in because if we don't force it in the early days, it never happens. You need the strength in numbers. But getting people in the door is just the first part of the uh, whole uh, effort. You've got to make them feel included. So we make people go through inclusion training, inclusion one, inclusion two, inclusion three. How to deal with diversity? How do you interact with women? How do you not tell male jokes in front of women? How do you not go and have a locker room conversation in front of women? How do you include them in the locker room conversation? So we go through these rounds of inclusion training and then if people do not conform to what we believe is appropriate workplace behavior, then we have to coach them or outplace them. So we have very clear norms on what PepsiCo needs to do to attract women. And the reason we do that is because it's the right thing to do for our business, not because it's a corporate social responsibility mm -hmm. goal. But clearly, educating men was part of the whole equation. And I think from a society perspective, we represent you know, the educated part of society. How about that woman that you talked about, Rajshri, who's going through domestic violence? Mm -hmm. How are we going to hold that man accountable yeah. for committing that domestic violence on her? I think we have to talk about that too. I think it's a super point, and, I, 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 yeah. and also the, the point you said later about it's good for the company, it's not just CSR. Like, it's not this altruistic thing, it's not charity, it's, it makes sense. Who wants to take that first, Maria? Well, I just, it feels to me that what, what's very important is that this does not come across as something attacking men or accusing men. 
Uh, I think the biggest enemy we faced is an assumption. There's an assumption that these issues are being addressed. And what we find when we do the work, that often there's a moment where the light bulb goes off. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize. So it's often a sin of omission, not a sin of commission. Of course, there's always bad players that are distinctly not promoting women or not giving women access. But I think largely what it is is the matter of raising that awareness. Uh, at, with in the International Center for Research on woman, Women here in India, we are doing a program that is fantastic where you work with young boys and girls and you talk very young about the gender dynamics. So when they say, what does it mean to be a man, they have a very different definition as a young person as they go into their own employment and their own careers. They already start at a young age with a different attitude about what, what a woman is, what does it mean to have a positive working relationship. But there are real questions here, whether it's the locker room jokes uh, or whether you know women feel the need to be like one of the boys or growing up, if you see a woman as a role model, you kind of feel that this is the only route to mainstream success because anything else is, is soft. I keep coming back to that, that mm. thing of soft. How does, this, how does this happen in the workplace? Because one of the other elephants in the room that we're not talking about is that a lot of men are resentful of uh, what women claim at the workplace. They see it as a favor, they see it as CSR, they see it as a politically correct tripe, and we've got to engage with that. So. Yes? Yeah, I had a shock the other day. I was on Singapore Air, and uh, there was a program, a television program apparently in the US called Mad Men. I don't know if any of you have seen an this. advertising show. It's an advertising thing set in the late 1950s, <laughs> early 60s. And the reason it was a shock for me is like I was looking back at my childhood. That pretty much was America in 50s and 60s. I think it's an accurate description. It made me think about how much has changed. So all of these activities, that those education sessions, you know, where, you, where in university or in school or in uh, work, when you go through those education activities, they do change your perceptions, and that's the beginning. It's very valuable. Yeah. But one thing I want to say is that this is about investing in girls. And in preparation for this, I was shocked. I really was shocked. I felt really sad. 60 to 100 million girls are missing from the world's population. 60 to 100 million girls are missing, mm -hmm. statistically. Mm -hmm. I never realized that before. So I, as a business person, I thought, how much would it take to fix it? I think it's always a start to say, how much money will it take to fix it? So having worked on rural tele telephony in India, I know that 50 rupees is significant for family because that will pay for a recharge voucher for a mobile phone, right? So 50 rupees is, a, is an incentive. So if you were to say <coughs> every month that your daughter's in school, it would be 600 rupees. Now why am I going to the economic issue? Because it gets to the fact, say there's 100 million girls that are there. If you paid 600 rupees per family per year for keeping their daughters in school, it changes that fundamental issue of the 60 to 100 million girls missing from the population. How much does that cost? That's 6,000 crore rupees. Is there a political will to put the money behind it? Is there a will from business people to pursue it? Because I think that's the easiest way, the most direct way, to get at a fundamental issue of 60 to 100 million girls being missing. Vinita, you want to add to that? And also to Indra's point about the elephant in the room. Yeah, I think both those points, I'd actually like to connect both those points. I think the point that Indra made is absolutely right. You know, we can't talk about changing anything for women without men actively playing uh, in that role. Because frankly, I do believe that we need those few Renaissance men who are going to put a stake in the ground and who are willing to uh, you know, make that commitment. And uh, you know, as far as women are concerned, we can have these panels, but we're still at the periphery. We've got to be in the game to change the game. And you know, to do that, we have to have the men collaborating. You know, the issue that you may talk about, economic incentive, I think that's right. But I also believe there is equally an accountability when things don't happen. So for example, you know, whether it is domestic violence or any other forms of uh, you know, harassment that women face, where is that accountability? Where do those people get, uh, you know, penalized or punished or whatever? And if I believe I can go scot-free with beating my wife or beating my daughter, and there are no consequences, then I will continue to do that. So I think the problem is an economic... But often the woman won't take it to the police station because she feels this scared. is her lot. Yeah. Because and that know, cuts across classes. It's not just the poor. 
And Barkha, that's exactly where this whole thing comes in. I mean, if you look at India, and if you look at the constitution of India, women have more equal rights in India than compared with a lot of other developed countries. But the issue is when those things are not, it's built into the articles of the constitution, it is built into the main body of the constitution, but what is the consequence for that not happening? When the answer is nothing, it doesn't happen. And you, you know, for that to change, the men are you know, equal if not you know, greater participants in that change because I think women alone can't bring that about and I think the sooner we accept that and invite men to participate in the change, the greater will be that uh, catalyst for change. Lord yes. Well, if I can just, I mean, taking exactly the point Indra was making, which is you, know, you talked, if I, and this isn't a criticism of the, of the way you phrased it, but you talked about the soft issues. Now, if you keep on talking about this as soft issues... No, I was saying that's part of the no, problem. I, I realise that. It's part of the problem. It's the perception that these are soft issues yeah. rather than intrinsically hard economic issues, let alone value-driven issues. And if there's anything that we've gone through in the course of the last two years, it has been a real hard focus on what are the core values that organisations need in order to avoid the great hiccups that have driven the world economy to the brink, if not in some places over the edge. And one of those values, it, I mean, certainly for us as a business and many others, would be understanding what respect for individuals means, which means under, understanding distinctively for men the approaches, attitudes, and behaviors which are restrictive to other people's progression. Now, until somebody takes a hard lens on me and looks at me and actually helps me understand what forms of speech and behavior, attitudes, jokes, performances, uh, groupings that I take part in which obstruct other people's progression, particularly women's progression, I won't understand the limitations I'm imposing on them. So for men, this has to be a place of self-discovery. And I think that that is something which you know, business organizations like the WEF frankly need to bring us into the place where the lens focuses on hard on men's leadership. And we begin to deal with it as a business hard, tough issue for the future. I think that's, that's an important point. Just time, I think, for a couple more questions. Yes, ma'am. Okay, two of you, just one of you go first. Yeah. I'm Andrea Camara with the International Center for Research on Women from the Washington office. Um, and I just want to uh, reinforce that um, I like the positive reaction that what can we do about it? Well, I think the, f the first thing is that there are lots of people who are doing something about it, <laughs> including the Nike Foundation and including, obviously, the people that we've heard from today. And including, interestingly, the World e Economic Forum, which publishes all these gender gap studies. So one of the things I think that as, as the World Economic Forum you can do is you can look at some of those gender gaps and see how you can advocate for it. I mean, I think the thing that worked in the United States, for example, to see where women have come, I think your point was exactly right, that people in the, women in the 60s and 70s demanded their rights. And that's what we come back to is, that's not soft issue, it's not whatever issue, it's, it's a fundamental human right for women to be equal to men. And then, even more importantly, each country has built that into their constitutions or whatever. So the concrete action, so, the, the thing about, of course, people now, and, 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 and what happened in the US once women demanded their rights, was that people took deliberate actions to in fact redress whatever the gaps were. So the universities took, uh, took deliberate actions to make women, you know, to attract more women. And I think these things can be done, just like, you know, they do, for example, as Indra said, in her organization, you take deliberate steps. You set a goal for yourself that this is a gender gap in my organization. We know from experience and from research that in fact, a little thing like saying, women welcome to apply in an ad where women have no idea that they are welcome to apply can make the biggest difference and can attract all kinds of women. So we know these strategies, we need to go out and look for them. And I tell you, one of the things that we haven't discussed is the huge gen wage gap that persists all over the world for the same work that women and men do. We have a huge gender gap. That's the thing, another thing that we need to look at. So we can pick any number of things. There are deliberate actions we can take. I encourage people to take them, and certainly people in this room are capable of doing that. Thank you for that. I'll park the point about the wage gap and take a couple of more questions because I think we're running short on time now. Ma'am, over here. Yes. Um, I work with PricewaterhouseCoopers. You know, I want to stick with this issue of what can we do and um, some of the things um, 
Indira mentioned and some of you have talked about. But I wonder if, um, if we shouldn't be talking something more fundamental here. I mean, I think what we have to do is question patriarchy um, because that's the world we live in today. So 95% um, of people I know, and I know some wonderful liberal people, will still want um, you know, a large proportion of their land to go to their sons. Um, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of very, um, very fundamental beliefs that we have. And, um, you know, I think we need all of us, uh, but particularly the media barkha, to question these things. Not going to happen overnight, but I think we've got to begin somewhere. No, point taken. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take three, four things together and then get last comments from the panel. Yes. Yes, I, I agree with uh, the importance of educating girls and, of course, the discrimination. But I'd like to say one thing about the missing girl. The missing girl is something that really makes me very, very sad. But there, it's the woman's education as well as men's education. Because you cannot really necessarily force a woman to. And in the middle class, there are lots of abortion. So I think you, only, you have to educate men, but you have to change women's uh, look at having girls and not just having boys. So that's just what I wanted to mention. There's a gentleman at the back there. And I, I, yes. I hope it's not a male's comment. I think a very important distinction has to be made between maternity on one side and the split of the household task, education, work on the other side. Um, big unfairness has to be repaired, indeed. But when it comes to values, we should also not go too much on the other side and only see the economic side. I think having a baby in herself is an experience that many of us men are a little bit jealous not to have. So for a lady to feel that she's fulfilled, it should not be only about job gender equality. I think in terms of value, a balance has to be found between that justice and the privilege to be a mother, which is an experience that others don't know. That's a, it's, a, it's a controversial and complex uh, debate. <laughs> I'll take one last question here, yes. My name is Thomas Joseph, and uh, my point is uh, functionally divi dividing the non-household jobs in the longer period of time in the earlier history and passing it to the generations made casteism prevailing in the society. Similarly, non-household jobs functionally dividing and passing it to the generations made this gender inequality. Keep this as a point. Uh, Ms. Chanda was making a point that to today's girls are tomorrow's mothers. Not only mothers, mothers-in-law also. Mothers can make the supply side push. Mothers-in-law can make demand side pull. So that also we have to take in mind. So okay. institutions can make supply side push, but sons and mothers-in-law can make that uh, demand side pull. Both these together, keeping that household jobs to the boys, the mothers can still do it. My mother was always doing for all, both the uh, sons. We have to do the household jobs because tomorrow you have to take 50% of the jobs in your own house. So this is I my point. I think that's well said. Uh, there was one hand here. Yes, up to you. Yeah. This has to be the very last question. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm a psychotherapist. I work with women. Um, your mic with I you. work with women, yeah. and a lot of the women don't even have money to buy medicines for themselves, so they spend all the money on their families. Why in countries do the governments not say that the man's salary can be taxed and part of it be given to the woman so that she can have choice? She can have economic independence to make choices. Well, okay, some very provocative uh, comments coming from the floor. Uh, uh, many people would say the eventual thing is for the woman to be able to have her own income whether through microfinancing instead of taking a cut from her husband's uh, income. I'm just going to take last comments based on some of the things we've heard. I'd like to start with you, Lord Hastings. The wage gap is an interesting thing. It, it, it runs all the way from labor gap in, in wages for daily labor to sports, to corporate jobs. It, it certainly does. And you know, as has been said before, there is no shortage of government regulations and law nor of conventions of behavior which have been set on this issue. Uh, it does come down ultimately to who makes the decisions. And very often the people who make the decisions about employment and about payment still remain to a dominant number men. 
And therefore, this issue about how do you change men's perceptions of being of greater value intrinsically yeah. than women. I think that, other than the, the WEF has done a brilliant job in publishing gender gap analysis, we all support that. We've got to go to the next stage of turning the information into programs of demand that rely upon business as well as public authorities. And that would be my concluding ambition. Rajshri, concluding thoughts? I believe that every woman must have a, some level of financial independence because financial independence gives a woman the freedom to live a life uh, with her choices and a life of uh, dignity. Maria, uh, someone spoke about everything being steeped in patriarchy and that we haven't spoken in a sense enough about that. I just feel that in my final comment, I have to say how inspired I am by India. When I go home, I think the message I want to take is, this isn't about India becoming a superpower or catching up. This is where innovation is happening. So I hope that the audience here feels challenged and inspired to have India be the example to the world of what can happen if you unleash the potential of an adolescent girl in poverty and you shift that equation. What will happen to a country that's saying 9% growth is what they're looking for? I bet you it will blow that out of the water. Chanda. Well, uh, I think this is a long journey and we have to work at every end, whether it's education, health, nutrition, societal attitude, workplace, gender equality, uh, you know, facilities around childbirth and so on. But if we look at it, I think there's two, two uh, approaches to handle this. Uh, it's important to have the men and the society at large uh, participate, as well as the women. But I think the way men and society at large can participate is by actually recognizing an economic necessity and benefit out of this. So the, the husband who engages in domestic violence, if he can see that there is a benefit of having a woman uh, you know, work and grow. And similarly, a corporate being run by either a man or a woman realizes that there's benefit in getting women. I think that's the way that section has to work with it. But at the same time, it's equally important that women themselves believe that they can, uh, you know, uh, strive to become economically independent, educate themselves, work, and then rear children and girls who also are going to be economically independent. So we have to work both ways. So the mindset that we have to work on is very different. And therefore, in my view, the core of the issue still remains that we have to make sure we educate our girls right from the beginning so that they come with this mindset, they come with this belief, and a large part of this whole thing can be unleashed when the women of this population believe that they can do it. And that's where we need to work on. So we need to educate our girls, but also bring up our boys differently? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think it changes a whole host of things. Um, you know, in addition to education, and I won't repeat what everybody said, there's one other factor which is very significant here, and that's the whole issue of, uh, you know, nutrition and malnourishment. And, uh, you know, we have women who are malnourished giving birth to men and, you know, boys and girls who in turn are malnourished. And, uh, you know, that in and of itself, there are a number of economic studies done there where you know, one of the estimates is that something like 2% of our GDP is lost because we've got people uh, you know, who are malnourished, who don't have enough calories to do the jobs they ought to be doing. So I think one other social aspect of this from an Indian perspective is you know, really to say that uh, you know, if the women are not healthy uh, in mind, spirit, and in education, they're not going to give birth to men who are healthy, and I think that's another very important aspect that we haven't sort of touched upon so far. Darren, last thoughts? I really like the comment that it's the mothers that educate the men. So you've got to get the uh, mothers educated, first of all. So I, I just am trying to think about this practically. It really bothers me that when girls are losing 4.4 years out of their education by the time they're 18, they're likely missing on the last part of middle school and high school where you really learn how to think. Unless you address that problem, I don't think you're going to get the level of education in mothers that really helps make fundamental changes in the next generation. So when you go through and you do the economics on it, it really wouldn't cost that much, at least to address the economic issue. And I wonder why we don't. Well, I think we've heard some great thoughts here. But I think, uh, as Sanjeev said, the important thing to do is to take them outside this room, to take them into our boardrooms, our newsrooms if we're journalists, into our banks, uh, into government and policymakers. And, Looking forward the next time to have, as Rajshri said, serious policy makers uh, who can interface uh, with people, and I'm saying people, not just women, with people who care 
about the rights of the girl. Thank you so much to the panel and to the audience. Thank you.